I begin, before I begin, I want to I want to start give a special thanks to Mike D'Alessio. Uh, if I am the father of no superior, then uh, Mike is the mother, and <laughs> you all should follow him on Twitter. Uh, okay. So, oh, OMG, OMG. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome to Ruby Comps 10. <laughs> I'm so honored yet again this year. Yes? Your floor is squeaking a lot when you walk around. Okay, I won't walk so much. Sorry. Um, I am honored to be here. I'm honored to be yet again the first person to welcome you to RubyConf. Thank you. It's great, great to open this. Uh, I love that it's RubyConf X because I think of it as the extreme RubyConf. Uh, so, my name is Aaron Patterson. Um, I work for a company called at and Interactive. Um, I am paid to work on open source software every day. We use a lot of Rails at work, so mainly I work on Rails because um, if I improve Rails, then hopefully uh, the applications within our company will uh, improve. So that is what I do. My Twitter address is tenderlove. Uh, my email address is this. And if you have a phone that can read QR codes, you can get my V card here. Uh, I also I also want to mention that I'm using I'm using a Wii mode to control my machine, and I took this trick from uh, Yugui at Ruby Kaigi, So uh, I encourage all of you to attend Ruby Kaigi next year, as I, I hear it's the last Ruby Kaigi, right? Is that right? Yes, the last Ruby Kaigi. So please go. Um, I'm a Ruby committer. I'm also a Rails committer, and. People ask me, how did I become a committer to both projects? So I want to tell you guys how, so that you all can do it too, because um, I think more participation is better. Um, and for Ruby, the, the process was very simple. Basically, uh, I went saw Matt's, and I said, I got in real close, and I said hello. And then, and then I got in close, and I said, commit, commit please. And then I went in for the kiss. <laughs> and well, Rails was actually very similar. <laughs> very similar process. Commit, <laughs> please, and then just go straight in for the kiss. Just in. So, and the thing is, you, you really you can apply this to the rest of your life. It it, it also works great with RubyCon. <laughs> Bam! I want to give a, I want to give a talk. <laughs> This, I have to put this slide in because um, every time I give a talk, I'm, I'm actually insanely nervous. I'm very nervous up here, and uh, a friend of mine told me, you know, when you're on stage, just think about, um, you know, what would Freddie Mercury do? <laughs> so, so I put this up here to remind myself to, you know, think about that and just calm down. So, uh, who, who's doing the RubyConf 5K tomorrow? So, a few people? Okay, awesome. Uh, I signed up for it, but I didn't know what it meant. I, uh, <laughs> I thought I thought it was a retirement plan. <laughs> there's no there's no units, so I didn't know that it was kilometers. <laughs> so so then I just read it as you know RubyConf five thousand. Right? <laughs> so I, when I realized that I had made this, this horrible mistake, I immediately started. Uh, a, a rigorous diet of um, these are these are corn dogs, but rather than corn dogs, it's actually a uh, Jimmy Dean sausage that's wrapped in a pancake. So I just I just started eating those, and I and I trained very very hard, and um, I took a video of the training, and I, I want to share it with you guys. So I'm gonna I'm gonna dim the lights up here, and so that we can see a little bit better. <laughs>
This is before Rails 3 was, was released, and you can go read up on the ticket here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought to myself, five times slower? Really? Five <laughs> times slower? How is that possible? And it, it is possible. It, it really was five times slower. So I figured, okay, I'll, I'll look into this and try and figure out what's wrong. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? Why, you know, what could possibly go wrong if you're looking into this? So, motivation. Why do we care about speed? We all know that Ruby can't scale and Rails can't scale, and yet we're all Rubyists, right? We use Ruby anyway, so why do we even care? As a tangent, I want to show you. I, I've discovered the I've discovered the technique for scaling Ruby. It goes like this. It's very simple, like this. <laughs> Look at that scale. It scales very beautifully. Now, now the thing is, the difference is when you the difference between Ruby and say Java is when you zoom in, you scale Java. It doesn't pixelate like this. So, that is the main difference. But, you know, I'm, I'm asking you all why, why do you want to make your code faster, and really I'm just trolling you. Uh, you know, Ruby, Ruby isn't super fast. We can write faster code in C or whatever, but, but usually the slow code is linked to poor code. So if we identify bits that are slow, we can find bad code in our system and get rid of it. When should I make my code faster? Easy answer to this, when, when it isn't fast enough. But then the question is, what is fast enough? Whenever I think about this, I think, well, do people notice it? And what are you comparing it to? In my mind, fast enough means that it finishes in a reasonable amount of time. And the important part here is that reasonable amount of time is subjective. Uh, you shouldn't spend your days focusing on speeding up some method that nobody uses, right? <coughs> so, what code should you improve? Only the code that matters. And I'm telling you all these things, but really, I don't want you to believe me. I really don't. I want you to think critically and go out and look at this stuff and analyze it for yourself. So, we're looking at Errol, it's too slow. How do we figure out what's too slow? Well, we don't even know that we're looking at Errol yet. We just know active record is five times slower. How do we figure out what the problem is? We need to find this bad code. We need to know what to measure. So let's take a look at our call stack. We know that our call stack looks something like this. Somebody says, post up, find one. We go down into Errol, which we're not sure what this code is. We can ignore it for now. It's, it's outside of our scope, because we're only thinking about Rails. We're looking at the Rails source code. And I told you Errol feeds the SQL into find by SQL, then it goes down into execute and down into log. So log is a very, I guess, I guess I should invert this. Log is actually the top of our stack. So uh, we know there's not really much code between find and Errol, but we need to narrow down our problem. So what I did is I looked at these three methods, find by SQL, execute, and log. And the ticket complained about work per time. They were trying to perform some amount of work, and it took too long. Performance degraded between Rails 3.0 and the current version, or between 2.3.5 and the current version they were looking at. So we need to figure out what had degraded. We need to benchmark. And when we're dealing with, when we're dealing with um, performance in our code, we have two enemies. Our enemies are time and space. But for performance, we need, to reduce, we need to reduce certain things. We need to reduce method calls, branching, and looping. And we need, to, we need to reduce objects. All of these things will help out our time and space requirements. But what I think is interesting is that for clean code, the things to reduce are exactly the same as the things that we need to reduce for performance. Therefore, clean code equals performing code. And another thing that is very important when we're going through this process of discovery is that measurement is paramount. If we don't measure this stuff, we don't know how much we've improved. Recently, recently we had a Google Summer of Code. Google Summer of Code, one of the students rewrote some of our libraries, our libraries in C, 
And uh, I asked, well, are there benchmarks for it? And the student said, no, uh, it should be faster because it's written in C. And we all know that it's going to be faster when it's written in C, but who cares unless we know how, how much faster it is, right? So the way we can find this stuff is through a couple tools. One of them is called Benchmark. This comes with Ruby. You can use it like this. We have a Fibonacci, a Fibonacci sequence uh, here, and we, we record a benchmark on it, and it looks like this when it's output. And the numbers, the numbers break down like this. We have zero amount of time <coughs> spent in system. So we don't spend any time making system calls. We're spending all of our time in user land doing computations. But this benchmark isn't very helpful. We just know that it took some amount of time to do this Fibonacci sequence, you know, some number of times. It's, it doesn't give us much information about how this Fibonacci sequence was generated. We don't know much about it. So what we need to do is we need to actually benchmark this over increasing iterations so that we can better understand the algorithm behind this that implements this Fibonacci sequence. So we need to increase the number of times that we, that we um, call a Fibonacci sequence and then plot them. So we get numbers that come out like this, and when we plot them, it looks like this, and we can see that the time is linear. So we're increasing at a linear amount of time. But writing this code is kind of a pain back here. So my new favorite tool now is Minitest Benchmark. Uh, is, is this released yet, Ryan? Uh, yes. Yes, it's released. <laughs> There may, there may be a beta gem, but you can use it. Uh, it's, it's very easy to use. Here's the same, here is the same benchmark written using uh, Minitest Benchmark. So we have this Fibonacci sequence. And the difference is back here when we were using Benchmark from Ruby Standard Library, it looked like this. But now we can do this. We can just say assert performance linear, and it does that iterations for us. And what's even better is that uh, it, asserts that the, it asserts that the growth was linear, right? So if somebody comes in and changes your Fibonacci sequence such that it grows at n squared or whatever, your test will fail. It's not allowed. This, this doesn't mean to say that your function can't get slower, because you can get slower and re remain linear. But this does keep the algorithm from going to some sort of exponential crazy thing. The output looks like this, and it's, it looks kind of weird, but the reason is because it's tab limited. And uh, Ryan and I worked together on this because uh, I was doing all these benchmark things and it was really a pain to get into the graph, into numbers so that I could graph it. So he made this benchmarking system so that basically you just take this, copy it, and then paste it into your spreadsheet program and you can get output like this. So we have some tools for benchmarking and now we need to write our benchmarks. We benchmark find by SQL, we benchmark uh, execute, and we also benchmark log. And we get the results from Active Record 3.0 beta. We see that they look like this. Our purple line, purple line is the bench log, uh, blue is execute, and the upper one is find by SQL. And in Rails 2.3x, it looked like this. And uh, I wanted to lay these on top of each other, but there would be six lines, so it was kind of hard to read, so I just laid the two log lines on top of each other. And we can see that the blue line, the blue upper line is from Rails 3.0, the, the lower yellow line is from 2.3. And what's interesting is if we look at the delta of this, the change between these two lines, the delta in find by SQL, the delta in execute, and the delta in log all equal. But since they're all dependent on each other, we know that delta of execute minus delta of log is zero, which means that the changes were in the log state. We know that the performance degradation happened in the log statement, so we can go analyze that more closely. And to do this, we need to use method call analysis. Uh, so what I used was perf tools RB, and if you're in a Mons talk, you learned a little bit about this, so I'm not gonna belabor the topic. But you run it like this, and the important part is we get a CPU profile out here, and for Rails 3.0 beta, we get a graph that looks like this. I know it's totally unreadable. We're going to zoom in. And we, get, we see the, the largest boxes look like this. And we don't know too much about what's going on. We know we're spending a lot of time in log and spending a lot of time in benchmark. But nothing's really popping out. Uh, text, 
the text output looks like this. Still, nothing, nothing is popping out at us. At two, three stable, we see a performance graph that looks like this, and we zoom in, and we see about the same thing. Now, Amon mentioned that perftools.rb is a sampling, a sampling profiler, and what that means is during the function during your method execution, it'll sample and see what method you're, is being called right now. And what's interesting about that is it means that if you run some method a thousand times, perf tools won't tell you that it was run a thousand times. It just tells you the percentage of times that it's sampled, and you're inside that method. Okay, so that's why we see these percentages here, and why the percentages in perf tools are so important. But if we want to see actual number of method calls, I use Ruby prop. The way I did that, I use use it like this. You put your code that you want to profile inside this inside this block, and then you just print out a report. Now, uh, I ran this for n equals 1,000 on Rails 3.0 beta. I got output like this, two, three stable output like this, and Things changed so much between Rails 2.3 and Rails 3.0 that there wasn't much, you know, there are many different methods between the two profiles. So what I did then was take a look at the methods that were in common. Most of the other different methods we weren't spending much time in. The methods that we had in common were time now and time allocate. And what was interesting is that in 3.0 beta we were making 4,000 calls to time.now for every 1,000 iterations. Where in 2.3 stable, we were making 2,000 calls. So we had double the number of calls to time.now in 3.0. So I fixed that, refactored it, made it so that time.now was only called twice. So it was the same number of times as in 2.3 stable. And I thought, wow, it's all fixed. And then a few hours later, it's better, but still two times slower. So I cut out these three methods from the stack. We knew that post.find hadn't changed much between the two versions, so the only thing really left in this equation was error. And on a side note, this is the time when Ryan told me I needed to rewrite error. <laughs> I complained to him about this stuff every day, and this was, this was when he said you should rewrite it. Um, but I didn't. Uh, I chose to make superficial improvements. I want to talk about superficial, superficial improvements to your system. Uh, superficial improvements to your Ruby system are when you have limited domain or system knowledge. And they usually involve VM tricks. And you get to see results quickly, but I believe that these results taper off over time. So at first you can look at your code, you look at this code and you can rewrite things in different forms to take advantage of the virtual machine that you're running on. So you can result in faster code, but these sort of uh, low hanging fruit taper off over time. So you can't get as much benefit for the amount of time that you put into it. So I want to look at some of these, look at some of these um, superficial improvements, and then discuss them and say why they're faster. And the first one is the adder adder accessors. Uh, this code we have some def sum attribute returns the attribute functionally equivalent code, and some of you may be surprised to know that. The adder accessor, the adder reader, is actually much faster than the uh, method form. And the reason behind this is because the way Ruby works is it walks an AST of code to execute. And as it's walking this AST, it needs to set up certain things. If we look at the C code for when we walk over an adder reader, we don't actually do that much. We go to the adder reader node and we just pull a value, basically do a hash lookup on that, on that uh, adder reader. But when we do a method call, the C code looks like this, and, and I'm not even going to show you all of it. it. It looks like this, and we finally, we do a bit more work, and we finally walk into this function called VM setup method. And VM setup method does, actually does a lot of work. It checks for stack overflows. It pushes a stack frame on. It copies your arguments. So we're doing a lot more work in this than um, the adder readers were doing. And one thing that's important to note is that this particular optimization is on all Ruby implementations. So it's better for you to write an adder reader than do the def, the method version. Uh, a lot of times I see code like this, where we'll say some attribute question mark, and what I like to do instead is just change that to an alias. 
The alias actually does a copy, so we get those same benefits of the speed of an adder reader, but we still get our predicate method. Next thing I want to look at is hack versus inject. Uh, and I'm looking at this because uh, I don't like inject. I see it abused a lot. We see this pattern very often. How many of you have written this? Yes, shame on you, shame on all of you. Yes, you're all, you're all fired. We can, re, we can rewrite that as this. Hash has a method called square braces, and it will do exactly the same thing. We can rewrite this as a map, a map and a hash. And so I want to benchmark between these two, an inject versus a hash, a hash and a map. And it turns out doing the inject is slower than the hash and the map. And the reason is because you're doing it wrong. <laughs> no, actually, actually, to be quite honest, um, there's a few possible reasons why you're doing this, but we're, we're actually doing a lot of work in this code. We're doing a hash set inside the inject form. We're actually doing a hash set. We're returning this hash. The inject needs to look at the return value of the block and then pass that on to the next iteration. We're in our more functional style one. We're creating a bunch of ob uh, we're creating a bunch of array objects and then passing them into the hash. Now, just for full disclosure, and I'm pretty sure Ryan will hate me for this, I noticed some strangeness uh, when I was performing these benchmarks, and that was that um, I benchmarked doing just a naked array iteration and a naked inject iteration, and these are doing approximately the same amount of work, but when I plotted it. Inject was far slower, and I don't know why. I really don't know why. I looked at the C code, and I can't tell you why one is so much slower than the other. Maybe Matt's can, or this is a bug. I don't know. Anyway, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I want you all to investigate this stuff, do research on your own. So, tangent, um, so that I can correct all of you who are doing it wrong when you should use inject. You should use inject when one calculation depends on the previous. So in this example, the return value of our block, the next iteration doesn't care. It doesn't care about the calculation that you did in here. You're just passing a hash in. What's the point? Here is a better usage. We need to do a const lookup. For example, we're doing const, you know, looking up a const. We have a string that represents a const that we need to look up. Each iteration through inject depends on the calculation of the previous iteration. This is when you should use it. So, next up is proc activation. A lambda versus just a method call. The results for this, a lambda takes much longer than a method call does. And why is that? The reason is because the lambda needs to remember its context. Ruby needs to store off the variables that were available to that lambda, and as soon as you call that lambda, it needs to recall the environment within which, that it, was, within which it was created. A method doesn't have that type of overhead. So a lot of times I see code where we say, you know, is this a proc? Is it a, is it a proc? And then we call call on it. But really what I wonder is, do we care that it's a lambda? Do you really care that that code that you're writing is a lambda, really? Or do you just care that it responds to call? If you just care that it responds to call, you could rewrite your lambda as a class like this. And that means you can actually reuse that code, use inheritance or use modules and mixins and whatnot. It's even easier to test, in my opinion. But we can talk about that later. So, Define method. Um, this code, define method versus a class eval versus a regular method. We see that the class eval is about, in, about the same speed as a normal method, normal method and uh, define method is much longer. And the reason is because define method uses a block. We're paying that proc activation fee that we talked about in the last few slides. Explicit block parameters. <coughs> this one may surprise you. These two methods. Which one is going to be slower? Explicit. Explicit, yes. Insanely slower. And the reason is because we're actually creating a proc object. So we're paying a, proc, we're paying a cost of creating a proc object, and 
garbage collecting that proc object. Now, sometimes we need a proc object, and there's a way to get around this. We conditionally need a proc object, and I hate this code that I'm about to show you, but it's possible, and I want to tell you about it. Uh, proc.new. How many of you know what proc.new does? Yeah, <laughs> I know you guys do. So proc.new, when you call proc.new without a block, it uses the block that was passed into the method. So if you call this block, this second, if you call this a block without the block given part, if you call this, you'll actually get an argument error. And it's because it wants to use the block that was passed. This code will output, um, in the first form down here, the code will output high, and in the second form it will do nothing. But if we didn't do that block given check, uh, we'll actually get an argument error. Uh, next one I want to bring up is symbol to proc. Symbol to proc. I'm sure everybody uses symbol to proc. Symbol to proc is much slower than just using a block. Now, the interesting thing is that if we look at it in 1.9, that's not true. So you need to know your audience. When you're doing these superficial, when you're doing these superficial performance improvements, you need to know who you're targeting. Now, when I'm writing library code, I'm more apt to use the block form. And the reason is because I know that many people will be using Ruby 1.8. And the delta between, uh, oh, did I mention that the similar proc is actually faster in 1.9 than the block form? Um, now, but the thing is, the delta between them in 1.9 is very tiny. But if you look at the delta in 1.8, it's huge. So I tend to use the block form. So knowing your audience is very important. Return value caching. I see a lot of methods like this, um, and I don't really have anything against it so much, as I wonder how many times is this method called? Because every time that method is called, we pay that or equals price. We check to see if that, that instance variable has been set. And I just look at this method and wonder, well, can the caller cache the return value? Do we really need to call this method over and over again? So, we've gone through and we've made our improvements to Arrow. We've taken all of these superficial performance improvements and applied them, and we're feeling better, feeling great. And we plot, we plot the values. And before the yellow line is before, the blue line, we've made these superficial improvements, and we're getting much better. But the purple line, the purple line is where we need to be. The purple line is Rails 2.3. So, what do we do? What do we do? We have to go deeper. This is this is my best uh, my best uh, what's his name uh, guy from Inception. I'm sorry, I'm still nervous. What would Freddie Mercury do? <laughs> so so what I did is I started examining the source code of, the source code of Errol, and I found that um, you know we had many classes where we included this module called relation, and we had 12 classes that defined the method bind. And uh, when I say to you the word relation, or when I say to you the word bind, if I, ask, if I ask five different engineers what these two words mean, I'm gonna get five different answers. And the reason is we don't have much context. It's difficult to understand what these words mean. It, it was infuriating to me to go through this code and find out that everything is a relationship. If it doesn't include relation, it inherits from a class that includes relation. <laughs> Everything responds to bind. Everything responded to bind. And everything had a relation. Everything had a relation, everything responded to bind, and everything was a relation. And because of Ruby's dynamic typing, I didn't know what was going on anyway. <laughs> so I understood from the code that bind was being recursively called on relation. But I just kept staring at it and going, how does it work? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I pulled out perf tools RB and I, I took a look at what was going on. I started benchmarking this and I found that we were getting lots of calls to class new. And we were spending a lot of time in the garbage collector. Which means to me that we're creating lots of <coughs> objects. We're creating lots of objects and throwing them away. So these objects were getting created and the garbage collector was coming along and cleaning them up. What we really needed to do was we needed to do data structure analysis. So I didn't understand how these data structures worked. 
I need to understand how they work. So I turn to one of my favorite tools, Graphviz. Um, if you don't know what this tool is, you should go to graphviz.org and download it. It lets you it lets you make directive graphs from text files that look like this. This is a valid graphviz file. It will actually output a graph like this. So it's a very handy tool for visualizing visualizing your problems. So the next step I did was um, I went to my Gang of Four book and used, pulled out the visitor pattern. And the reason I wanted to use this is because I needed to examine these data structures from the outside. I wanted to graph this data structure so I could understand how it works. And the way the visitor pattern works is we implement one method like this. In Ruby, the way we implement it is like this. We implement an accept method, and what it does is it looks up the class name and it dispatches to a different method based on the class of the object that you passed in. So let's say we feed in an object, an Errol, uh, an Errol alias object. This will dispatch to a method named visit Errol alias. And inside of visit Errol alias, we call, we look at the we look at the class definition of Errol alias and we figure out what its, what its uh, methods are that we can call. And then we call into that one. We call accept on the return value of that. And we keep walking through these relationships. So as we're doing this, as I was doing this, I would, I would visit one class and then I would get an exception. But I knew the type. So I would implement the method for that type and then go look at the source code and figure out how to walk that type. And eventually, I was able to produce from from this class. I was able to produce a dot uh, a dot visitor to produce graphviz files that worked with the data structures used in Errol. And this is what came out: <laughs> spaghetti. So I tried to figure out what data structures actually mattered and cut out some of the cruft at the bottom. And I came out came up with this. And what it was, once I looked at this data structure, I really understood what the algorithms were doing. Um, when I thought about SQL, producing SQL, I thought in the um, compiler sense. So we produce an AST and we take that AST and turn it into SQL. So I assumed that someone would implement it that way. I assumed I was looking at an AST of some sort, when actually it wasn't. It was not an AST at all. It was a linked list. Well. We can, talk, we can argue semantics, but it is a linked list. And the way it works is we walk this linked list. Each, each item in the linked list contains the data for which you uh, called it. So if we say like post.where1.where2.where3, .where .where then we have nodes for each of those calls. And it stores, the, it stores the parameters for those. So we have a linked list that looks like this, and it just stores all the values along it. But the way that it worked is, it recursively called back along this relation. So it would call back, call it, calling bind, and bind would dupe the objects. So we would end up with objects like this. this. This is what our graph would look like, and it would continue on. If your linked list continued forever, this would continue forever. And to make this more concrete, uh, here we had you know, where 1 equals 1, where 2 equals 2, etc. And it will actually walk out, and our tree will look, our, our linked list will eventually look like this. Okay, now, big O. O stands for OMG. <laughs> and, and when your big O gets big enough, you use a big Z, which stands for a Z OMG. <laughs> so what big O is, is big O is a mathematical representation of an algorithm that you're using. And really, it can represent anything. We can, we can use this mathematical represent, representation to measure uh, the amount of memory that we're using, or the amount of time we're consuming, or the amount of function calls that we're making. Really, anything that we want to describe about our program, we can, we can describe in terms of big O. And I want to look at a few uh, big O functions and then talk about the big O of Arrow. So here we have a constant time, a constant time function where no matter what the inputs are, it takes a constant time to produce an output. Slightly, slightly worse, we have a log n. Uh, this would be for, say, doing a binary search. We do, when we give a certain number of output, inputs, we get a certain number of outputs, and when we plot those, it looks like a log. Here we have uh, linear growth, so it's proportional to the input. Here we have n log n growth, which would be like 
uh, heap sort or maybe a quick sort in the best case scenario. Um, here we have squared growth. So these are the ones that you usually run into. Um, in order to find the big O, all we have to do is we take, we take an input, a known input, and then we measure the output, and we plot that. That's all we have to do. And once we've plotted enough points, we look at what mathematical function would produce those same points. So, Errol's big O. We start with one object, we get one. Two, we get, what is that, three. And I can't remember, but it goes like this. So, as we increase those nodes in that list, our graph of objects in memory looks like this. And what does this look like? This looks like n squared. If you said n squared, you're pretty much on, but it's, it's exactly this. Now, as we increase n to infinity, we find that the one half drops away and n squared, the value of n squared rises much more quickly than the value of n. So really we can just call this big O of n squared. So now we understand the number of links that are in this list, the number of, the number of links that are in this list, we square that and that's the number of objects that are gonna get created in our system. So when somebody reports a bug that says, Active record in Errol takes over two minutes to generate a pseudo complex SQL query. We know why. We know exactly why. And unfortunately, no amount of um, no amount of small improvements like the ones we were looking at earlier will fix this. We have to do we have to do deep improvements. And the things I, I don't like about deep improvements is I think that your system impact looks a little bit like this. Our knowledge grows, but we can't really make many deep impacts to the system until we know more knowledge. It's more expensive on us to make these things. But in Errol's case, we know what the right solution is. We know that this should be an AST and a visitor. These are known technologies. Generating SQL is a solved problem. We know that it can run in ON time. So we wonder, should I rewrite? We, we have a clear solution. We have many tests for this, for this code. The public API is limited. So in my opinion, yes, we should rewrite this code. Six weeks later, Errol today. Errol is now ON. It took six weeks to rewrite. It is now two times faster for doing the post stop find one case. The adapter specific code is dry. Um, if you run this, it's actually the post stop find one, the simple case is actually slightly faster than Rails 2.3. Um, our flog scores before were about 2,500, the totals. Now it's about 1,800. The flay before, 684, and flay complained about 12 times. Today it's 420, and there's seven complaints. And what's even cooler is we have, we have new features now. We can do this. So when we make a query in, a, in active record, we can actually see the SQL parse tree. So the output from this will look like this. Thank you. So if you want to see how complex your SQL statement is or how the parse tree looks, it's right there for you. So arrow tomorrow. Right now we just have SQL compilers, but Errol just stores an AST. And what that means is we can write anything to translate that AST. It doesn't have to be SQL. We already have people who are working on this for uh, integrating with Mongo. So you can walk this AST and go, rather than produce SQL statements, go out and get data from Mongo. We can even write optimizers if we want to. Any type of fun compiler tricks, we can do that with Errol. So, conclusion aka the things I've learned. System impact. It looks like this, and right there in the middle is a very depressing time. <laughs> Our superficial improvements grow logarithmically, so when we reach the top there, it seems like we're not doing much. But when we want to do these deep improvements, we can't really do much there either, and our knowledge is too limited, so it feels like we're stuck in a rut. But if you keep going on and learning more, you can actually apply these deep uh, improvements to your system and make things even better.
I learned, when should I rewrite? This is the rewrite timeline. This, this bar is actually the timeline. The left side is, um, is the earliest you should rewrite, and the right side is the latest you should rewrite. And uh, I see it like this. The earliest you should rewrite is when Ryan says so. The latest you should rewrite is when I say so. So you should probably pick a time in between. If you, if you need to know, just ask Ryan, then ask me, and then pick a time in between. <laughs> We emphasize the art of code, and we should not forget the science. I want you all to learn the specific, but embrace the generic. Here are the photo credits. I need to say thanks to the Evil Twin. Thank all of you. And one more thing, this is RubyCon, RubyConf 10. Uh, give Ryan a kiss. <laughs> Remember when you're when you're um, when you're rating the talks, it's rated by number of slides. I had like 259, so high rating. Also spandex and kisses. That is <laughs> that's how you get a high rating. Uh, yes, in the back.